have read, all that I have, I haven't read Mark until now, it's very moment. I've read uh, all his books, his uh, previous two books um, on modernity in Kathmandu and middle class in Kathmandu. So, um, Far Out is a primary uh, history of uh, tourism in Nepal in that it traces uh, how Nepal uh, became a destination for global tourism after it opened its doors in the 1950s. Um, what makes this book really rich and fascinating is uh, it not only uh, recounts some really important and interesting events, but also explores some of the key ideas that shape tourism in Nepal and also tells the stories of uh, individuals who actually uh, the first individuals who propagated and were able to sell these ideas. Um, and uh, I think there are two, two broad questions, there are many things that the book does, but two broad questions that the book tries to address, uh, I would say is, one is, um, how have uh, different generations of Westerners imagined Nepal over time? And two, um, and how have their imaginings shaped tourism in Nepal, or what Mark calls uh, the encounter between Nepalese and foreigners? Uh, so, uh, in his analysis, uh, Nepal, tourism in Nepal has uh, evolved through three distinct phases. The first was uh, uh, began in the 1950s. Uh, and when, because at the time it was still not easy for or easy for people to come to Nepal because it had just opened its doors, uh, so few tourists were arriving here, and they were mostly uh, well connected and wealthy European and American elites. Um, and for them, uh, Nepal was this um, pristine land, far from Western civilization. Uh, land of mountains and um, festivals and royal coronations and yeti hunts. Uh, so in fact, uh, the first uh, proper hotel in Kathmandu called the Royal Hotel was uh, established during this period by the legendary Boris Boris Lisanovich. The book has a really fascinating chapter on Boris uh, where it talks about how this uh, Russian guy who used to manage a club in Calcutta, came to Nepal and became the father of tourism under King Trivon's patronage. Um, so, uh, in the second phase, uh, it, no, no, actually, I should add, uh, what about the Nep what about Nepalese though during this phase? This was a very early phase of tourism. So, interestingly, for Nepalese, tourism was still a very alien concept back then. Um, they couldn't understand why foreigners would come to come here and why they would want to see mountains and rural life and things like festivals and temples because for them uh, these things were just uh, impediments to modernity and progress. So uh, the book has a, some really amusing and um, insightful passages uh, that show how Nepalese gradually learned to you know, wrap their heads around uh, uh, Westerners' fantasies, and soon enough, they learned how to turn those fantasies into uh, money-making ventures. So that's 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 those passages are really interesting. So the next phase of tourism, which uh, Mark calls uh, the hippie age, spans the mid '60s through the mid '70s, uh, no, early '70s. So it was uh, in the West. It was the time of the civil rights movement and uh, the Vietnam War, and a lot, many youth, many middle class youth wanted to, you know, were disenchanted with their society and, and wanted to rebel against the consumerism and, and war mongering that afflicted their societies. So these youth uh, found a perfect escape in what Mark describes as, as um, the exotic, cannabis-friendly, cheap, and welcoming streets of Kathmandu. And this is just one example of how vividly the book uh, evokes the atmosphere of 70s Kathmandu. And in fact, I think the section on hippie tourism is the heart of the book, uh, and probably the most interesting. And um, 
So one, there was one very striking feature of this phase of tourism, and it was that it was the lower caste Nepalis and not the uh, elites, not the Nepali elites, uh, who actually catered to these hippies because uh, they were free from uh, notions of purity and caste-related, like other caste-related taboos. Uh, these locals were able to turn their homes, like very simple, basic homes, into low-budget uh, tourist, low-budget uh, restaurants and lodges for these tourists who were mostly young and broke and were uh, traveling on shoestring budget. So it was a very different kind of tourism. And when you read this, it's hard not to look back with some kind of nostalgia, you know, just, just because of how much things have changed. Um, and this, this age, the hippie age, actually began to fade um, sometime around the mid-70s, um, because by then the countercultural, this anti-establishment spirit, spirit of the 60s had begun to wane, and it was being replaced by um, you know, pretty conservative and consumerist values. Uh, for instance, in 1973, the Nepal, Nepal government uh, banned marijuana under international pressure. And uh, the Nepali government you know, wanted to, was eager to keep up with the dominant global ethos, and so um, they started to get rid of these hippies, um, these scruffy, dirty, kind of broke young people, and in order to promote a different kind of tourism. And now the new kind of tourism it, the government wanted to promote was targeted at uh, you know, richer and cleaner, you know, more well-heeled uh, foreigners. So this is what led to the birth of adventure tourism. And for this type of tourism, Nepalis have a, were able to cash in on a readily available resource, and that was uh, Westerners' you know, infatuation with mountains. Uh, the book does an excellent job of showing us that this mania for mountains is not a natural thing, but a socially and historically constructed phenomenon. Because uh, it reminds us that there was a time when mountains were actually uh, feared and detested for being empty um, and barren and dangerous uh, terrain. And even actually the very idea of uh, climbing a mountain for pleasure was unthinkable. It was only towards the 19th century, uh, in the Romantic era especially, that mountains, you know, as um, Westerners and people in the West started becoming disenchanted with um, you know, modernity or modern life, that mountains started being portrayed as um, an antidote to the, like, the ills of Western civilization. Um, you can see if we look back at like, 19th century literature and poetry, you can see how mountains were starting, you know, where people, uh, people were starting to perceive mountains differently. Um, and for those uh, who were uh, looking to cure those ills of uh, Western civilization, there could be no grander destination than the remote Himalayas. Now these mountains uh, symbolize not just physical courage, but also you know, moral and spiritual purity. So Nepal skillfully tapped into this desire and um, rebranded its mountains into trekking areas. Uh, and actually it was during the 70s that the government created all these national parks and reserves where um, wealthy tourists could experience you know, nature and wilderness. Now, uh, the heyday of uh, the Freak, Freak Street was over and Tamil actually emerged as uh, the hub of uh, Nepali tourism during this time. And, uh, and there, now, there, uh, gradually, there was like a full-scale service economy featuring um, trekking companies, gear shops, and mountain flight operators. Uh, the number of trekkers and mountaineers multiplied each year. There was a lot of coverage, of, you know, uh, the, all these adventures received a lot of coverage in, in the Western media. And uh, some, some of these people also went back and wrote best-selling books and made movies about these adventures. 
So another interesting point that the book makes is how these adventure tourists differed from uh, the hippies. Actually, they are different in a crucial way. Again, I can't help putting the author here because there are so many passages in this book that I want to put. Mm. So he writes, a trap is something one not only does, but crucially buys. Unlike the hippies, trekkers came to Nepal in search of a commercial service, the adventure. So these trekkers were more cautious, less open to conversation, more afraid of being cheated, and seemingly less curious. There was also another difference, which is that hippies had little money but lots of time. So they could, you know, they could just hang about and laze around, mix with locals. They had to walk all over the city because there was not much public transportation back then. And uh, in contrast, these adventure tourists were cash rich but time poor. So meaning they wanted to squeeze out maximum experience within the shortest possible time. And uh, the surest way to do this was to buy experience in packaged form. So this is how uh, like the face of tourism gradually changed. Uh, there's another category of adventure tourists that the book examines, and which is equally interesting. And they are the dharma tourists, you know, foreigners who came looking for spiritual experience in uh, an exotic landscape. Uh, so instead of spending money on trekking agencies and guides, these dharma tourists spend money on uh, meditation retreats and you know, like lamas and gurus. So, so um, both the uh, trekkers and dharma tourists are primarily interested in finding themselves rather than in more, I mean, they're interested more in finding themselves than in getting to know the place and people. I mean, at least that's what the book suggests. Um, and so, the craze for Buddhism and the obsession with mountains are essentially the same phenomenon. Uh, and actually, the book has a really compelling section on how uh, Westerners turn Buddhism, which is actually, which actually denies the existence of a fixed self into this tool of self-therapy and you know, self-discovery. It was all about the self. And how actually, and how the Buddhists, in response, actually, especially Tibetan Buddhists, uh, reimagined their religion to actually fulfill the quest of uh, these Westerners. Uh, so it was like a two-way process. It was never a one-way process. Uh, so we learned that uh, the famous Kopan Gumba in uh, Bodha was actually established in 1969 at the initiative of wealthy socialite who had led a glamorous life in Paris and New York, and then after being disillusioned with life, probably, uh, started to decided to strike out on a spiritual path. So, and actually the main goal of establishing the monastery was to uh, spread Buddhism in the West. And there's a really, uh, uh, there's a section on, in the book that describes how this was done. So as Buddhism became more and more trendy among Westerners, the dharma tourism uh, market also began to expand here. Um, and now we know where it is at, right? I mean, we all know that like, meditation and yoga and mindfulness is now a global industry worth billions of dollars. Uh, and in Nepal, there are companies that offer things like spiritual adventure tours and yoga treks and enlightened travel. So as Mark writes, what tourists think of as a quest is for Nepalese and industry. And for me, I mean personally, I mean, this is one of the main takeaways from this book. In other words, uh, for many Western tourists who come here, uh, Nepal is just a screen on which they can project their longings. But it is not a passive screen. It is uh, because Nepalese are adept at harnessing those longings. You know, for for their own purposes. So it's, again, it is an encounter, a two-way process. And this is, I think, something we constantly witness in Kathmandu and in other tourist areas of Nepal. Right? And, and in fact, one of the reasons why this book resonated so strongly with me is because um, I have also constantly witnessed this. Um, I, 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 I trek uh, 
I mean, I have trekked in many of the most of the um, commercial trekking routes in, across Nepal, and um, although I enjoy it, is all the, I always feel that there's something, something um, incongruous and something uh, absurd about the whole experience. You know? The the way the romance of the mountains exists alongside this really crude commerce of the trekking industry. And um, so I, when I read this book, I felt like, oh, wow, this book really hits the nail. And uh, I felt like uh, I, it would really help, it really helped me make sense of my own experience uh, as a trekker. Mm. But I must also add how readable and engaging this book is. Uh, because I'm not sure if it's so easy to find academic, uh, an academic work that uh, I mean, I have uh, come across so many academic works that that can be written in such clear and you know, jargon-free language. Whatever theory that Mark draws on is uh, blended so seamlessly into his argument. Nothing seems you know, extraneous or funky. So, and the book is filled with um, really sharp, witty, and astute observations, um, which again goes on to prove that. A serious academic book doesn't always have to be stripped of style. And uh, for me, uh, the book was also refreshing for another reason, and that is because most anthropological works on Nepal that I've come across, uh, especially by Western academics, focus on um, a particular ethnic community in a rural setting, uh, most or many. Maybe. So, but this book, as well as Mark's previous two books, uh, examine phenomena that we in Kathmandu are very much a part of. Um, and it's uh, really interesting to see our immediate milieu become the object of analysis, uh, which was very different, I think, for me. And it's also remarkable how the book you know, manages to uh, cover an entire cross-section of Kathmandu society in the course of uh, analyzing, uh, you know, exploring the history of tourism. So, for all these reasons and more, I think um, this book will be of interest not only to academics, but also to Nepali, ordinary Nepali readers. We will all find many things that will be connected in this book. And I think that to anyone else who is interested in Nepal or in the encounter between foreigners and people in our part of the world, I think that will happen.